Hello, this is Anita Bell, the Motown Bell, coming to you live again from Detroit, Michigan, with a slide presentation just designated for the Reparations Labor Union. It's dedicated just to this topic, so it's a shorter presentation of the open letter to Benny Napoleon presentation that's about an hour long but I was asked can you abbreviate it for some of us who have uh, less time so that's what I'm trying to do Rose this is for you all right this particular idea of the reparations labor union was inspired by the Benny Napoleon for mayor of Detroit campaign so you see here a picture of Anita Bell me with Benny Napoleon and I learned through this campaign about the parallels between slave labor and the modern labor crisis. And of course, many people who support Benny Napoleon are people who are members of labor unions, particularly these would be police officers, firefighters, um, EMS workers who, like Benny Napoleon, the former police chief and a former Detroit police officer, they are facing their pensions being eliminated by Detroit's bankruptcy and emergency manager. Um, just a little review of what's in that open letter to Benny Napoleon video is that Detroit, as you may know, is going through a municipal bankruptcy. The state of Michigan, through its emergency manager, Kevin Orr, is asking a federal judge, Judge Stephen Rhodes, to circumvent Michigan's constitutional provisions that protect pensioners and say that Detroit is too broke to keep its promise to pay the pensions for firefighters and police officers and their surviving spouses just in case a firefighter or police officer was killed in the line of duty. So these people are entitled to a pension which is protected by the Michigan Constitution which says that the pensions aren't supposed to be touched. Therefore, when Detroit is broke, supposedly, that's another story, and can't afford to pay the pensions but can afford to pay $62 million to um, Orr's consultants under the emergency manager provisions, um, they don't have money for the pensioners, but they got money con for consultants. And my question is then, if a bankruptcy judge grants the state of Michigan and Kevin Orr's um, request to let Detroit go through the bankruptcy and these pensioners no longer get their pensions, then it's not like these pensioners can go to Social Security and say, um, now can I have my Social Security because they don't have a backup in Social Security. That was why the Michigan Constitution sought to protect them because they knew Social Security wouldn't protect them. Uh, another federal program is the federal uh, pension insurance program and that also doesn't protect them because the federal pension insurance program is for private corporations not for government entities like a city government so that they don't have a federal backup in Social Security, no federal backup in the federal uh, pension insurance program. So these people would just be SOL or out of luck. And uh, the federal bankruptcy judge Kev, uh, asked Kevin Orr and, and, and uh, Michigan's governor Rick Snyder if Michigan, since they're asking for the pensioners to be screwed, uh, would Michigan then be willing to guarantee their pensions from the city of Detroit with the state of Michigan guarantee their pensions since this is what Michigan wants and uh, that's a good question let's see I love it that the judge asked such a brilliant and insightful question and I hope he holds their feet to the fire but just the entire labor crisis that is going on in Detroit reminded me of a labor crisis that happened in 1865 that group of laborers made America great, but they received no wages, no pensions, no benefits. They were essentially sent into retirement, if you want to call it that, when they're freed from slavery, and they were said that they were told, "We don't have anything for you." Matter of fact, there were benefits paid to the slave masters who um, compensating them for freeing the slaves, but nothing was given to the slaves for their labor. Now, the 400th anniversary of America's particip 
participation in the transatlantic slave trade comes in 2019. So according to American history, the first slaves were brought to Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. So just basic mathematics, 1619 plus 400 is 2019. Those of you who know the Bible in Genesis 15 and other prophecies know about the 400th year anniversary. So with America coming upon that anniversary in 2019, we are starting now in 2013 to make a reparations labor union and a deliberate push for reparations to be given. 2013 is critically important because another Bible verse talks about every 50 years is a jubilee. 2013 is a jubilee of many, many anniversaries. So it's 150 years since Abraham Lincoln gave the Emancipation Proclamation. 50 years since my cousin Medgar Evers was assassinated in Mississippi. 100 years since the birth of Rosa Parks. 50 years since Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech was given first in Detroit, then in Washington, D.C. at that very important march that happened in August of uh, 1963. It's been 50 years since the assassination of President John F. Kevin Kennedy. And it's also... 50 years since the election of Detroit Congressman John Conyers into the U.S. House of Representatives. So he didn't take the oath of office for Congress until 2014, but 50 years since his election to Congress. In 2013, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of I Have a Dream, the speech that Martin Luther King gave when I was just a baby in 1963. But a dream has been deferred for 50 years and longer than 50 years when you consider the plight of the people who were freed or retired from slavery in 1865. That dream is of some kind of compensation to be given to them for their labor and thank you, apology, something to be given to them. They are a labor movement that has never been organized until now. So in solidarity with the labor movement that is now experiencing a similar um, taking away of their pension, I decided to um, found the International Union of Heirs of Transatlantic African Laborers. We're doing business as the Reparations Labor Union. Now, the purpose of this labor union includes funding Detroit Congressman John Conyers' H.R. 40 legislation that he has been proposing in the House of Representatives since 1989. What I'm saying to add to his platform would be, in addition to an apology for slavery, slavery is that we ask for reparations to be given on a voluntary basis through a national tax-free lottery. Let me explain the Jubilee Lottery. Tickets can be sold to anyone, especially online, for at least $2. Now, by anyone, I am saying adults, and of course, that means we may have to do it through retailers. There are things to be worked out here, folks, but the overall premise is that jackpot prizes would be awarded to anyone, black, white, green, yellow, purple. And when you win that jackpot, that you will not be taxed federally. So that is the incentive for everyone to volunteer to pay into reparations, that if you win, and I'm saying blacks don't have to be the ones who win the lottery, that indeed it should be it should be, could be whites that win the lottery, and when they win this Jubilee lottery, that they receive their winnings without being taxed federally. Now, lotteries in various states, because right now they're controlled by states and not federal, lottery, lotteries in various states have dedicated purposes. In Michigan, the lottery is dedicated to education. In other states, it might be dedicated to roads or museums or, or parks or other public purposes. I'm saying that this Jubilee Lottery would be dedicated to compensation for the heirs of transatlantic African laborers. And these people could be any American who, on the date of their application, is at least one-eighth African descent, 
Where did you get one-eighth African descent from, Nita? All right, that's the Dred Scott decision. Look at the video called Open Letter to Benny Napoleon. It's under my Motown Bell YouTube channel. That's where I got one-eighth African descent. Also, born before January 1st, 2020. Where did you get that from? Well, that's in honor of the 2019 400th year anniversary. We're celebrating all of 2019. So if you're born January 1st on 2020, then it's after 2019. Also, anyone whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States on or before January 31st, 1865. Where did you get January 31st, 1865 from? Okay, again, referring you to the longer one hour some long minutes video called Open Letter to Benny Napoleon. If you want a full explanation, there's one place. You could also read my book if you want 300 pages of history. Then there you go. The book is called Revealing Mistaken Identities. But those are the, those are the people who would be qualified for compensation. Now, the applications would be processed in Detroit. Why? Detroit needs a job. Secondly, in honor of Detroit Congressman John Conyers, because he is the one who has been proposing this in Congress ever since, eight, uh, eight, not 1869, 1989. All right, so he's not that old. Please forgive me. That's an uh, error. All right, uh, but also in honor of our elders then they should be the first to receive payouts of the Jubilee compensation. Let's be real. Um, I'm not sure how old John Conyers is, but I know that my parents voted for him in 1963. So my parents, of course, are well into their 80s, pushing 90, and I would love for them to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Um, I know also that they threw up their hands, praised God, that they lived to see Barack Obama become America's first black president. I would like them to live to see Jubilee compensation being paid to them. So let's give it to our elders first. I'm also saying when we give the compensation that it should not be taxed by state, federal, or any local government. I'll repeat. The jackpot prizes, when they're given, they can be given to anyone. At least that should not be taxed federally. It will be up to each individual state and municipality to make sure that the funds, when distributed to the heirs of transatlantic African laborers, that those funds are not also taxed by the state or local governments. But at least we can make it as part of the federal legislation that it's not taxed federally. Finally, I'm proposing that prisoners be eligible to receive their payouts for their compensation upon their release from prison. And this is very important because it's meant to serve as a carrot, an incentive for our people to stay out of trouble and rehabilitate. The war on drugs has been a war on black people. Now that I went into in more detail in the book Revealing Mistaken Identities. Yes, I am the one who sued the CIA for bringing the drugs into the black community. That's another long story. But now that we have it here, one way that we can stop it is to go ahead and say to our people, if you stop selling drugs, stop getting in trouble, then you have some money coming to you from reparations. And that should maybe stop some of the violence in Detroit, in Chicago, in Newark, in Los Angeles, in Atlanta, in all of these places where some people are really uh, being provided an incentive to 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 keep war going on, a drug war going on, gang wars going on. This is a way to stop the violence. Now, there is a song that has a verse in it called Just the Right Spice to End Your Slave Days. It was sung by Seth Brightman. Uh, it's a Kabbalistic song. But I just took the line from that Ver, uh, from that song, Just the Right Spice to End Your Slave Days, because it's time to finally put an end to those slave days. Detroit has a population of approximately 700,000 people. 83% of that 700,000 is of African American, um, of, of African descent. So, of course, if we're providing compensation to the descendants of African slaves, then 
83% of Detroit's population is going to benefit from that compensation. Now, let's be real. How are they going to spend that money? The reparations labor union would have different ways of proposing wealth management so that we could bind together or come together uh, and form businesses and make lasting economic changes and economic development. Uh, but I know some people are also going to spend some money to help end their individual slave days. So if they're tired of catching the bus, then they're going to want to buy a car. Well, that's going to really benefit Michigan and especially the auto industry. So we are understanding that there's going to be consumer things that come out of compensation to slaves, but we want to have lasting economic development because that is where if we manage our wealth properly, then we will be able to be more self-sustaining in the future. Now, another point of the HR 40 Jubilee compensation is basically to send a message on behalf of the entire labor movement. And that message is that any debts to laborers, whether you want to call them a pension or wages or benefits, any debt to a laborer can never ever, ever be discharged, not even in bankruptcy. Let's look at corporations, whether we're talking about private corporations or municipal and public corporations like governments. These corporations can last hundreds of years. Detroit is more than 300 years old. The city of Detroit, as it is as an entity right now and part of the United States, so the city of Detroit is older than the United States when you think of the United States being born in 1776. So the city of Detroit is even older than the United States. There are not any people who are 300 years old that I know of, but their people live in perpetuity through their children. So... A debt was owed to a group of people like like folks that were retired from slavery in 1865. A debt was owed to them. It was not ever paid. It's assumed to be forgiven, but, but forgiven by whom? It's forgiven by the people who impose the debt themselves. That's not forgiveness. That's just lack of payment. If I said I took out a credit card and I didn't pay it, I can forgive myself of that debt. And no, there isn't a seven-year time limit on it, not on this type of debt. It's not even included in the national debt. So when they talk about the national debt, is trillions of dollars. When you think of what you owe people that you have for self-forgiven from your debts, you owe a whole lot more than a trillion dollars. But those debts can never ever be discharged, not even in bankruptcy, because your corporation is perpetual or if you want to call it eternal. It's not really eternal. It started at a particular time. Uh, eternal doesn't even have time. So it started at a particular time. It's perpetual. Your debt is also perpetual. And therefore, the people that you pay, if the actual person you owe is no longer living, that doesn't mean you're out of it because you're perpetual. Just pay their heirs. You can't even discharge that in bankruptcy. And that's the message that should be sent. The second message that should be sent by the Jubilee Lottery is that it serves as a model for implementing reparations in other nations. I have had people who are from Jamaica look at this, love it. From other parts of the Caribbean, love it. Yes, Haiti, this is for you. Yes, yes, Portugal. You should you should pay something to people in Brazil. Yes, Spain, you have some debts that you still owe people in other parts of South America and Central America. So yes, this is a model that is setting up for other nations. And it can be voluntary. That's the whole beauty of it. If everyone's concerned about the world debt, well, your world debt is much larger than what you think because... You, it's including the debt that you owe these people from hundreds of years ago. We haven't forgotten or forgiven that debt. So you still owe it, and we would love for you to go ahead and pay it, and even pay it voluntarily. That's the beauty of it. So in conclusion, all we need to make reparations a reality in our lifetimes is the will to do it. I know there are some people who say to me, Anita, just let God. This is their idea of faith. Really, 
faith without works is dead, people. God is not a genie and he waves a magic wand, he does all the work and we just sit back. That's not, that's not faith, that's fantasy. So, let's keep, let's keep this real. The negative part that should be driving us, the stick, if you will, is that Detroit does not need to keep catching hell. That Detroit's turnaround or revival shouldn't be based upon being sold and sold out in a bankruptcy fire sale. Remember, hell, like a cold, is contagious. Don't let it come to a city near you. That's the stick. But the carrot is that the vision is for an appointed time. Now, Jubilee is that time. Does God need to let a piano fall on our collective heads? How many signs do we need? All of the 50 year anniversaries that are in 2013 alone. Now is the time to start the Reparations Labor Union and now is the time to join the Reparations Labor Union. We have strength in numbers. In the United States alone, are 40 million potential members for this labor union. It is really cheap. You see, I, I made the membership dues really inexpensive so that it's $5 per year for a family of up to five members in a household. Well, Nita, I, I stand a dorm. There's five of us here, but we're not family. Okay, fine. That's five people in a household. Go ahead, all of you put in your dollar. That, and that takes care of you for the year. I have more than five children. And, and Yes, well then that's going to cost you more than five dollars. Uh, I'm the only person in my household. That's, that's five dollars that's cheaper than a pack of cigarettes. But what are we using this money for? We are using this money to form political action committees or PACs. And that way we can support candidates who support reparations and the labor movement. Let's be real. This is a type of vision to start a Jubilee lottery that needs to be a federal law in the United States. In order to do that, John Conyers can propose it in Congress as he has for the last few years since 1989. However, it also has to be passed in the Senate and then signed off by the President. It can be done, people. We have to start seeing that our support is not just black people, but everybody who supports the labor unions. In Michigan alone, we have as senators Debbie Stabenow and presently Carl Levin, but Carl Levin is retiring and um, running to replace him when he retires is Gary Peters. Well, both of them happen to be white. Let's not look at them as, oh, they're going to automatically be opposed to reparations. No. They see what is going on. Michigan is a very labor-friendly state. At least it was until Rick Snyder came in and pulled that right-to-work stuff. But they still are labor-friendly, and therefore they're going to understand the the ideals of a labor union. And if, and because they do, especially Gary Peters, since he's running, if we have a political action committee, we can make sure that labor-friendly people get into these political positions like the Senate so that they can move the type of legislation we want. We just saw Tea Party Republicans shut down the government. Not only were they able to do that by their candidates that are in Congress and the Senate, but they also were able to do that because they had money. So are we going to just sit back and let these people with their radical agenda, shut down the government again because their idea is, well, we want to make sure Obamacare fails. What are they worried about? Are they really trying to pe prevent poor people from having access to health care? Is that their problem? Because that sounds like genocide. So I don't think that's the, I don't think that they are necessarily genocidal. Maybe they're just racist and they don't like Obama and they don't want a black president to succeed. After all, if he succeeds and he's popular,
popular, then in 2016, maybe we'll get another Democrat. So they have to do these things. Maybe they're not just being racist. They're just trying to plan for 2016. But whatever their excuse is, the next time they shut down the government and threaten to make sure that America defaults on its loans and sends the whole world economy into a depression, then a very strong labor union like the reparations labor union in solidarity with all of the other American labor unions can say we're calling a strike. So that is my idea. We can make reparations a reality in our lifetimes. Have President Obama's back and then have PAC money where we can say we'll have your back if you have ours. Let's move this and make it a reality in our lifetimes before 2019. Thank you and God bless you.